John asked me to come talk to you about uh, the indie web, and I thought, well, you know, I've, I spoke for John about nine years ago, and uh, a lot has changed since then, but there's, there's some good things coming up. So let's talk about this. Presentation text is all under Creative Commons. So what that means is you can copy any of the text in the presentation, you can cite it, uh, you can use it for whatever purpose you want, as long as you just attribute it. Um, and that's, I do that deliberately, because I also have other folks' text and things in here that I want you to attribute. So if it's, if it's mine, attribute to me. If it's other people's, use their attribution. Uh, it's all in the good spirit of sharing. The second thing I've done is, uh, if, if you happen to be online um, and with a laptop, you can use this etherpad uh, to take notes or to, to note any questions that you have, etherpad.mozilla.org slash uh, WDC14, pretty straightforward. Um, I have it open on a separate laptop so I can sort of watch to see if anyone, anything pops up in particular. You're like, hey, that's, that's wrong, or there's a problem there. Or, you know, feel free to point anything out you want. But now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's, let's go ahead and this is the basic outline I'm gonna talk about. And that is, uh, how do we get from sort of this, this notion of the, the independence and the independent web that we ha used to have back in the late 90s and early 2000s to the rise of the silos, which is kind of dominating our lives on the web these days, um, to finally a return to uh, what we're calling now the indie web, a new approach to having an independent web. So those are the three basic areas I'm gonna cover. How many of you recognize this logo? Anybody? Anybody here? No. Okay, so this is from 2001 and I had a site in 2001, but I didn't have a blog. It just had a static site where I would throw various different files on, up there, you know, things like various hacks and such, which I hope none of you are using anymore. Um, this, was, this Independence Day effort was a great effort done by Jeffrey Zeldman and a couple of his friends and colleagues uh, to just basically celebrate uh, independent work online. And they put up a manifesto, they had a beautifully designed site. It was done by designers, you could tell. They were passionate about it. Um, I'll show you a bit from the manifesto. Independence Day is a worldwide project celebrating independent content and design on the web. Now, that sounds really familiar and sounds like something we can all get behind. They promoted this, they had sessions about it, they organized tracks even at South by Southwest of folks that were really passionate about this. And it seemed like, well, yeah, this is, this is exactly the way to, the web should be built. The web was meant to be, everyone's got their own independent site, or company site, or family site, and all interlinks together um, using all this wonderful technology. And those of us that had the good privilege to go to South by Southwest, uh, especially in the early days, in fact, I should ask, how many of you here have been to South by Southwest? Anybody? At least a few people. Okay. Not many. Interesting. Pretty new crowd, I'm guessing, then. Um, so back in the old days, uh, South by Southwest was this amazing conference in spring of every year in Austin, where the, South, the interactive portion of it tend to be, became this like meeting of anyone who's creating anything on the web that could actually get there. Uh, if, whether you were in the US or whether you were in um, Europe or anywhere else. Uh, you know, it started, it was very sort of US centric and then more folks started coming over in different years. But here you can see a picture. Um, and in this photo, this is from 2002, you can see a few folks that you might recognize like uh, Stuart Butterfield here in the front. He's the, one of the co-founders of Flickr. Uh, Matt Howey here. Uh, he co-founded Metafilter. And really, the, the South by Southwest conference was this gathering of people that were all multidisciplinary creatives. So they had one or more, they had multiple things they were creative about. Either they designed or they coded, or maybe they were a visual artist, or maybe they were a filmmaker or a musician, or at least two out of those above. And it was kind of this magical gathering where you just assumed that anyone you met, A, was creating something interesting on the web, and B, had some story that, you didn't, that, that was gonna surprise you. Like you would never know when you're gonna run into the, the author of one of your favorite blogs. And that, and that actually takes me to uh, the next point, which is that back then, the gatherings at South by Southwest, a lot of us just knew each other through our domain names because we found each other on the web. We would uh, read each other's blogs and people's, people's brand, their names were, oh, you're Photomat. Yes, it's, it happens to be Matthew Mullenweg, but everyone knew him as Photomat. Um, plenty of other domain names like that as well. And so the, all our badges said, hello, my URL is, as opposed to hello, my name is. And you know, you look at that today, and what do our badges have on them now? They've got our names, but they've got our Twitter handles, right? So 
uh, how far how far we've fallen. And it really took some perspective to understand this, but I, I think in 2003, we kind of hit this moment of peak independent web. We kind of assumed that's how it was always going to be. Like, everything was working. Everyone had their own site. Why would we assume anything different? Well, what happened? Well, silos happened. So this is where we are today. We're, we're, we're interacting with them. We're using mega silos. And how the heck did, we, how did, the heck, how did that happen? How did we just get from everyone being known by their own domain to everyone being just a contributor of content to one or more silos where you know, all your interactions are just essentially turned into a series of ad clicks? Well, it started like many things do, with good intentions and with trust and with friendships and with communities. So this is, a, this is Flickr's tag cloud. In 2004, a number of friendly silos, we didn't even call them silos back then because they seemed so innocuous and friendly and cooperative, and a lot of them were built by people we knew, by friends, by colleagues, by comrades. And so they, and they provide these amazing features, tags, folksonomies, aggregation, this notion that you could actually see what, was the most, what are the most popular things that people are posting photos about uh, anywhere. And so we started to give up bits and pieces of our sovereignty. We started to say, well, you know, Flickr's got this great place to share photos. My friends will see it, so I'll just upload photos there. Plus, it's run by great people. You know, what could possibly go wrong? Um, and look at all these cool features that we get on Flickr that we can't get on our own sites. Flickr was like this. We put our pictures on Flickr. We put our links on Delicious. We put our events on Upcoming. All of these were built by individuals that were active in the community, that were creatives in this like, you know, online web creative community. They all had their own blogs. So we, we said, yeah, they're one of us. Like, how could this possibly go wrong? Well, another thing that's happened at the same time uh, from 2002 to 2006 is we really saw the emergence and the rise of social networks. Anywhere from Friendster to MySpace to Orkut to Facebook. Uh, I think I probably had an account on all of these. I mean, how many of you out there used Friendster at some point, at least? Okay, a few folks. MySpace? Anybody? I mean, yeah, a lot more. Uh, Orkut? I don't know if that make it out here. Okay. In, in Brazil, it was almost the entire country, apparently. Uh, and of course, I, I'm, I'm guessing that almost everyone here is on Facebook, right? Okay, don't deny it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but how did this happen? Why did this happen? Well, with hindsight, we can kind of look at like three main areas of what, what were the incentives, what were the motivations. The first was it was really easy to sign up on any of these services. Uh, they made it really simple, and by doing that, uh, the lower, lower entry barrier, all the lower barrier to entry, all that kind of thing. Um, the second is you could find people on there. You could find, you know, not only your friends, but you could browse your friends' friends, and you could browse their friends. And this kind of like being able to walk the social graph, as it were, was very seductive because people like to know that kind of information like, oh, who do my friends know? Maybe we have friends in common. How many friends in common do we have? We had no such thing for the web. Yes, we had blog rolls. How many of you remember blog rolls? How many of you had a blog roll? I used to have one. Okay. All right. So you remember, so those kind of worked like friends lists. Like you'd say, oh, there are your friends there. We even had the format called XFN, XHTML Friends Network, to mark up your friends and things. Um, but there was no service that aggregated all that. Or if there were, they were experimental and it didn't really scale. So social networks could do that, could scale. But the last uh, big realization that it's taken us a while to figure out this one of the things that happened with social networks that didn't happen with the independent web was an integrated reading and posting interface. Nearly every single social network uh, had a place where you saw what everyone else was doing. What are your friends talking about? What are your friends posting? Who are they friending? What events are they going to? Integrated into that was a place where you could comment. You could write a post. Or you could comment on all of their posts. Right? How many of you use a feed reader? Wow, quite a few still. OK. The model of feed readers have, haven't never really evolved. It didn't involve much at all. Uh, the whole, The whole model was, well, you'd go over to your feed reader, you'd read your feeds, you'd catch up on that, and then you'd go to a completely different interface, depending on what software you were using, to write a blog post. There wasn't this seamless like, back and forth interaction that you would get with these social networks. And that, that ease of experience, that sort of comfort with like, oh, I'll read something and I'll just throw off a little quick comment, was really seductive. 2007 saw the emergence of Twitter pretty much worldwide, right? I'm going I'm to guess most of you probably are on Twitter since we have Twitter badges and aliases on, on there, right? Um, 
I actually really miss this. I miss this simplicity. And, and Twitter really kind of popularized simplicity, or perhaps simplicity popularized Twitter, and showed us, oh wow, everything can be this simple, everything can be this, this easy to interact. But this is an example of what I'm talking about. Right there, you see what everyone's doing, and you can just, you know, one text box, one button. Extremely simple UI. I mean, if only it had stayed that way, right? This is not what Twitter looks like today, in case you haven't checked the website recently. Um, but this, that's what it used to look like. The other thing that Twitter did in 2007 is they put up screens all over, around South by Southwest which created this amazing feedback loop. You'd go there, you'd check out a screen, you'd tweet something, hey, I'm at South by Southwest, you'd see your tweet show up. Of course, then everyone else that was on Twitter wanted to also, you know, participate. And that kind of blew up out of control. 2007 was a watershed year in, in several ways. The other thing that happened there is that Facebook held their first F8 platform, you know, developer conference, and they launched their platform. They basically opened it up and they made it clear they wanted everyone to plug into what they were doing. And this, was, this was a huge statement, because Facebook had started very, very close, right? Twitter started completely open. Anyone could sign up, and then all your, your information was open and public by default. Facebook, you had to be a, a member of a small handful of universities, then maybe any university, then maybe a company, and then anyone could sign up, and then they made a big platform out of it. And very different, very different culture, not interacting with this broader set of like web creatives I was talking about. Um, the very next year, they launched Facebook Connect. So how many of you have an application or a website where either you're required to or have the option to use Facebook Connect? I'm pretty much, I'm guessing everyone here has seen this, right? These guys were the first ones to really move on this, and they innovated. So around the same time, we had OpenID on the web, but the experience of using it was horrible. Facebook fixed this. Facebook made an incredible user experience, made Facebook Connect just work seamlessly and in a, in a trustworthy way. And can you believe that that's been around since 2008? Six years still. So contrast that with just yesterday. In San Francisco, Facebook held their F8 conference. Okay, I want you to compare these two pictures. Like, look at this one here. You've got Facebook, it's saying, oh, we've got a few sites we're connecting. City Search, Twitter, Dig, CBS. Okay, and this one. What's the message that they're sending here? They've got these hexagons here. It kind of reminds me of like a worker bee hive, right? Tendrils extending everywhere throughout the planet. They're not, they're not making, they're not pretending at all that they're not trying to like dominate the entire world in terms of networks and social graph and all this stuff, right? So what does that remind you of? A worker hive. Once again, a hive by any other name. God, they're just silos. So while these silos were rising and distracting us, there was an even worse thing happening. And that is that sites were getting shut down. In 2008, AOL home sites shut down. Anyone here have an AOL home sites page? Anyone at all? I'm guessing not, because it wasn't really targeted at creatives and coders and developers like us. This was targeted at sort of the every person, right? Um, sometimes we're building products for these folks. But this is, this is a small snippet of the discussion forum on their site when they announced that they were shutting down uh, the AOL home sites uh, service. And I want to read just this one comment in the middle for you. What a shambles and poor show. No one wants to know either. Fortunately, I saved my web page and transferred it to GeoCities. Just a year later. Now, we laugh because we think it's funny, but it's also incredibly tragic. People had posted so much content to GeoCities. Um, parents had posted memorials for their lost children, all kinds of different pages. The Ge GeoCities, I mean, we laugh at it, it was one of the first sort of like easy to use, easy to get started on, hosted content services that gave you a lot of freedom in terms of what you could create there, right? I mean, freedom, of course, meant that you had a lot of really interesting content, um, a lot of walking back and forth, Felix the Cat, a lot of digging guy. But it was, the, it was sort of like the raw expression of creativity on the web, and it just got shut down. Yahoo shut it down. Um, you know, who knows their exact reasons for doing so? But all these people's content was lost. Tragedy. Of course, these shutdowns have continued. Um, just last year, upcoming.org shut down. One of those friendly silos I mentioned early on, communities. And this is a screenshot by the, one of the co-founders, Andy Bio, who took a picture of it and posted it and wrote a blog post about it. He didn't have any control over this, because he'd since sold it to Yahoo. 
Um, yeah, another Yahoo shutdown. Big surprise there. Um, they also shut down the old delicious site, sold the domain. So I don't think any of those old delicious links are around either. And the real tragedy here is that a lot of us, web creatives, back in the early days, we used Upcoming because we thought it was a safe place to put our stuff. We thought, hey, we know Andy, we trust him, and we know what, what, whatever he's going to do, he's going to take care of the site. But that turned out to not be the case because once you sell your site, you don't really have control over what's going to happen to it, the URLs, the content, or any of that. A huge amount of the web's early history in terms of web developers getting together, web technologies being developed, a huge, history, a huge amount of like what was Web 2.0 is lost because upcoming has been shut down and those events are gone. Another one last year was Posterous. Did anyone here have a Posterous account? A few folks. Okay. Did you export your data at least? Anybody? Did you save your site? I hope you did. Okay. Some folks did. But you know, Twitter decided this wasn't worth it. was another acquisition. It got shut down, not worth keeping it around. And so the lesson here is really clear. Um, there's tons of these site deaths. We've been documenting them on the Indie Web Camp site at, at a page called Site Deaths, right? Uh, and it's, it's really tragic. Like, if you really feel like being depressed, go check out that page every year. And in fact, we have announcements out there as well. So if you want to see what site's going to get shut down next, you might want to check that out as well. So, what went wrong in 2003? I mean, I had this, I had this slide up here earlier. Photomat.net, we have our own domain names, so much so that we know ourselves by our own domain names rather than our Twitter names or any handles like that. And I said, well, I think we kind of hit peak indie web here, peak independent web. What happened? What went wrong? Well, several things went wrong. So I think this is one of the biggest things that went wrong. I mean, to paraphrase, I saw the best minds of my time, the best minds of my time waste their time arguing about syndication formats, arguing about plumbing. Users don't care about plumbing, but for some reason we thought that that mattered. We thought that actually really mattered which XML tags to use in RSS versus Atom, uh, what level of precision should you put on dates and times, what properties should be required and shouldn't be required. Right? None of that actually turned out to matter at all. And I think part of this came from a sense of arrogance. Those of us that were around back in 2003, we kind of assumed that the independent web was the dominant model. Of course, open wins. And one, once open has won, how could it ever go back? How could we ever possibly, like, you know, we didn't even conceive that everyone would be putting their stuff into silos at some point. We thought that was an impossible outcome. I mean, it was just pure arrogance at that point. And so we focused on the wrong things. We argued about plumbing instead of user experience. More plumbing, trackback and pingback. There were technologies to actually connect websites, independent websites back then. In fact, some of them are live to this day. But what happened to those? Well, trackback is basically a form of spam at this point. And of course, I, I felt like, well, I might as well show you an example from Mozilla's own blog. Um, if you look, if you can see down here at the bottom, the bottom trackback is from a site called Free iPhone 4S Now. That's probably not a legitimate site. I'm going to just take a wild guess there. And pingbacks. How many of you have pingbacks on your personal sites or show them? Anybody? A few folks. OK. So what the heck is going on here? Like, there, there's about, for all of this, there's maybe like 5% of this, this data is actually interesting. You get a pingback from some post and some blogger at some point in time. But then there's this weird ellipse text. It's, completely, it's complete noise. It doesn't actually tell you anything. It usually says, read more from the source, and includes the name of the original blog post. Well, I'm looking at the original blog post. I don't need to see that again. And, and this really belies a lot of the back-end plumbing-centric design that was happening back then on the independent web. It wasn't being designed for users. It was being designed uh, for back-end programmers who didn't give enough care to what the front-end looked like, to what the user experience looked like. So a lot of this led to the decline all this led to the decline of personal sites, decline of the independent web. Right? We were distracted by format wars. Uh, blog user experience stopped evolving. People started to go to social networks to connect because you couldn't connect across your different uh, personal sites, or the social networks did it better. And perhaps, most importantly, silo user experience evolved. You look at what Twitter did with integrating you know, simple posting, eliminating the title, just having a little bit of content, or what Tumblr did, how easy they made it to reblog something or Facebook's, all of Facebook's innovations to the user experience. They advanced 
the state of what you could post and interact with on the web while all, those of us with independent sites did nothing. Right? We just sort of clung to our formats. And that was, not, that was the wrong thing to do. The other sort of uh, almost evil thing that started to happen here is that Facebook and others introduced all these different forms of interaction, likes, other activities, that started to make us dopamine dependent. Right? I'm sure some of you have experienced this, where you're like just constantly checking to see if you got feedback. Oh, did I get any likes on my new Instagram photo? You know, that kind of thing. This is a real thing that's being studied by psychologists and sociologists. Like, if you just search for uh, Facebook dopamine, I'm sure you can find uh, plenty of references on that. And that, that, caused, that, that kind of distraction was you know, anathema to actually getting anything done or focusing on anything. In fact, it was best illustrated, there's this web comic like this. There's all this shiny stuff happening on the internet over here. Go check it out. Meanwhile, my blog is boring. I have to write something, you know, I have to focus to actually write something long form. And that's kind of a summary of what happened. The web became this huge entertainment area, and our blogs just really kind of stayed the same. They didn't, they didn't really pick up any innovation. But regardless, a whole bunch of us tried anyway, right? We're stubborn like that. Those of us that work on the open web, we're not going to ever give up. And so various meetings got held. Uh, O'Reilly held a meeting in 2008 called Social Web Food Camp. And this is Blaine of Twitter at the time and Ralph of Jaiku. And they actually got Federation working, cross-posting between Twitter and Jaiku. They actually got this working. So anyone on Twitter could post something that someone on Jaiku could read, or someone on Jaiku could post something, and people on Twitter could read it, and you could subscribe back and forth, and they got all this working. But unfortunately, this was a connection between two silos. And silos do not have incentive to actually have Federation work. So this was nothing more than, I'm going to use the same picture again, Silos federating? No. It's just ephemeral lightning. So they got it working, but I don't even know if it actually shipped in production or anyone was actually able to do it. It was technically feasible. Business incentives didn't line up, so it didn't happen. So we learned an important lesson there. No matter how smart the developers are, no matter how eager they are to get stuff working, no matter how technically capable it is to make silos interoperate or federate, the incentive, lacking the incentive structure it's either not going to happen, or it's going to disappear. Well, we kept trying. So what do we do next? Well, the folks at StatusNet convened in 2010 a Federated Social Web Summit, where they invited folks from all kinds of different backgrounds and projects. Uh, people working on Apache, people working on XMPP, people working on Diaspora, all these different efforts of like, how can we advance the state of the art of how we federate things on the web? And some of the discussions were interesting, but it really turned into, unfortunately, more of a frustrated social web summit. And let me give you a few reasons why. The summary, the short summary is there was too much talking and too little, not enough building. Um, and among a lot of that talking were a lot of what, what, uh, what's, been what's been coined the term ast ar architecture astronauts. I don't know if you guys have heard this term before. I'm not going to uh, dive into it too deeply. If you just search for it, you'll find a definition. But suffice to say, an architecture astronaut it takes a problem and abstracts it so high that they completely lose touch with what user problem they were trying to solve in the first place. And they end up solving a problem that no one cares about. This happens all the time. Uh, there were more talkers than doers. More people that want to talk about how to do something rather than actually do it. And a lot of this leads to, when you, when you don't need to check your work by trying to work, make it work, it leads to complacency and complexity. So a lot of the standards that we were trying to make work at the time, Atom, Activity Streams, Salmon, OAuth, a lot of these were way too complicated for people to actually implement. Um, supposedly, we needed all the features that were in there. I mean, if you listen to all the talkers, they insisted that, especially the folks from Enterprise. But when you get complexity, you, you end up with things that are too hard, too fragile, and too few implementations. And a standard without implementations is not a standard at all. A bunch of us left really frustrated. We realized we don't care about free federation. We really don't. We care about our content, and we care about interacting with our friends. That has nothing to do with federation. Federation is almost like one of those architecture astronaut words. So we said, we need to think of this problem differently. We need to declare independence. And we came up with a notion, Aaron Precky and I, of why don't, we, why don't we work on something that we reframe as the indie web? So we kind of chatted back and forth a bit. You know, it took us about a year, but we, uh, Aaron and I joined forces with Amber Case and Crystal Beasley, and we co-founded Indie Web Camp. So 
what does that mean? What does it mean to co-found Indie Web Camp? Well, we, we have a website, IndieWebCamp.com. We created an IRC channel for simple discussions. Uh, we decided that everything we would put on the website, we would ha have required public domain contribution using the Creative Commons CC0 license. And the reason for doing that is we wanted our work to be able to go anywhere. If you followed any of the discussions with like Wikipedia or content being share alike or GPL or all that kind of thing, there's all kinds of open source projects, all have their own different licenses, and sometimes they have a hell of a time sharing with each other. We said, screw it. We want to work on this stuff, and if people copy us, great. That means our ideas are succeeding. So we're going to put it all in the public domain. Um, and then adopt a culture of attribution, because it never hurts to give people credit for stuff. Lastly, the, we realized that one of the most important things to do was to actually convene an in-person bar camp, dev camp. Despite the fact that we were frustrated at the Social Web Summit, it turned out that having those conversations did actually stimulate ideas, did actually like, get things um, going in, in at least a subset of the people. So we said, OK, we're doing an indie web camp, and this is a nice logo that uh, Crystal designed for us. Well, what does that mean? OK, let's constrain it. Let's not repeat the problems of the Federated Social Web Summit. We're going to make it all about showing, not telling. You got to get stuff working. We're going to make it creators, creators only. So you got to be someone that either writes code, does design, layout, user experience, visual design, some sort of, you create some sort of craft that you post on your own website, that you build your website with, and that you share it. We even made people want to, we basically said, we're going to set a bar here where you have to be serious about this. You have to have your own domain. Not only that, but you have to set up OpenID. We know that's no, non-trivial, but we're going to set this bar arbitrarily because we think that's going to be a good filter. And it was pretty good. We put the event list on the wiki. We made you log into the wiki with your own domain name and RSVP. That's something that it would take five minutes to do if you are on um, the IRC channel. So there was, it turned out to be a pretty good fil filter. But it turned out to also scare a lot of people away. So we also decided to say, you know what, if you're a creator, and if you have a friend who's curious about the indie web, Maybe they don't have their own domain yet, but they want to know how to do it. Or maybe they don't want to ask in a public forum where they might be embarrassed. You can bring them as an apprentice. And that actually worked out really well. This is everyone that showed up to the first Indie Web Camp. It was much bigger than we expected, and it was about the same size as the previous Federated Social Web Summit, but almost everyone here has their own website. I mean, there's a very broad set of people here, ages, everything, um, everywhere from like Ward Cunningham the inventor of the wiki, came up with a new way to do federated wikis at Indie Web Camp. To uh, Chloe Weil, here, she came to her first Indie Web Camp in 2011, and yet last year, she built on her own site a Twitter clone, so she can now tweet from her site. So she showed up as an apprentice this year, you know, 2011. Two years later, she's building a complete Indie Twitter clone on her own website. What did we learn? Well, one big thing that we decided we we're going to do differently, no mailing lists. This was a big, big deliberate decision on our part of our community. We said, no mailing lists at all. OK, why is that? Well, I mean, to be short, to be brief about it, you're not going to email your way to creating a website. You're not. Uh, email lists essentially are how you would optimize a forum for people that want to write very, very long amounts of text, but not actually build something. So if that's what you want, you can use email lists, but we wanted to focus on building. Plus, there were plenty of email lists already out there. So we didn't need to create another one. So instead, you know, let me, let me show you. Like, this is what a mailing list archive looks like. For a single message, most of the archive is just like header crap. You don't need any of that. Um, and then even the message itself is sort of like just talking back and forth about something silly. Now, compare that with this. This is our IRC archive. We're having a complete conversation here, back and forth, back and forth. And it's almost all content. There's a little bit of time date stamp metadata, a little bit of who's saying it, but it's almost all content. Like, there's, there's very little content actually here of one message, and here we have an entire conversation. This illustrates the difference in efficiency of the two formats. So a lot of, a lot of what we've figured out is when you force yourself to actually be a creator, when you say one of our principles is self-dogfooding, if you believe in an idea, build it, and put it on your own site. If you don't want to put it on your own site, then why should anyone else? It turns out, when you try to build stuff for your own site, it forces you to simplify things to the absolute minimum possible. So we took all these existing technologies. We took OpenID and said, you know what? We can do a better job. We can make it simpler. It went through a couple of iterations, Realme Auth and an Indie Auth. We said, instead of having to put all these like, invisible link tags in your header, 
random gibberish that you're going to base, barely get wrong. People on their independent websites were already linking to their Twitter sites, already linking to their GitHub, already linking to their other profiles. We said, you know what, just add rel equals me to those existing hyperlinks, and we'll make those authenticate for you. The other big evolution is people had started to put a lot of data into HTML, microformats, microdata, RDFA, all these different approaches. Turned out they were all way more complicated than necessary. And we, we worked together, we developed huge simplifications and came up with microformats too. Simpler, even less, even simpler than microformats one. Less markup, it's a much simpler generic syntax. And so at this point, the indie web community has pretty much completely abandoned all those other techniques because this one's so much simpler. Um, another example, pingback, which was an example from the old days. Right? We, took, we, we didn't want to invent anything brand new, we just said, what can we take and evolve it? What can we take to simplify it? Uh, we started to follow the pattern here with pingback and say, well, if you actually drop the XML RPC piece and just use HTTP, it's much easier to support, both in terms of sending web mentions and receiving them, writing the code to do so. It turns out you just don't need XML. You just don't need XML RPC. There's this acronym that I really like for this usage called YAGNI. Have you guys heard that? You ain't going to need it. It turns out with XML RPC, you ain't going to need it. HTTP just worked just fine for that use case. It made things, all these optimizations made things easier for both publishers and consumers to support these technologies. The nice side effect is when you simplify all this plumbing, it gives you a lot more time to focus on user experience first and foremost. And that's what we should have been doing in the first place. And that's what we have been doing in the indie web. So we learned from the silos, right? The silos are innovating in user experience. We said, you know what? We can do that. We can do better. Twitter elevated a reply, an at reply, to the status of being its own web page, to the status of being a sort of first, a, you know, first degree object on the web. And we did the same thing on the indie web. So here's Aaron Parecki posting his site, a reply that has its own permalink, and showing what he's replying to. This is a direct user experience like copy, mimic of what Twitter was doing, but he's doing it on his own site. We learned from Twitter. He posts an indie web reply on his own site, and then pings Lawrence's site where the original was and gets incorporated here as a comment. This looks like a normal comment, but that entire piece of content came from here, came from Aaron's site. And that's pretty impressive. So we actually got federated comments working for the first time just over a year ago across different sites. Right? That looks a lot nicer than a pingback does. In fact, let's take a look at what pingback displays look like again. Right? Yuck. That's not what you can tell what the heck's going on here. Right? The comparison between pingback, you get no good user experience compared to web mention and, and with microformats too to transport the information. Here's a simple post. How did you get to know the, how did you get to pet the baby goats? And Ben Wordmiller replied, you got his face here, you got his name, his, his URL, the full content of the comment, and the date and timestamp. Looks kind of like a tweet, doesn't it? But it's not. It's on, on her own site. So we've copied the best user experience from the silos. So we simplified them and made it work on our own sites. I'll compare that again. That's pingback. That's web mention. It's like night and day. This I want on my site. This I never want to see ever again anywhere on the web. But we didn't stop there. We realized that by making small improvements, we can actually do things like federated events, indie events. This is on Ben Wordmuller's site on word.io, where he's got, he posted an event to his own site saying, here's an event that's happening. It's got a date, it's got a time, it's got a location, uh, start and end time. And he's even keeping track of RSVPs here. Okay, well, those RSVPs aren't typed in on his own site, right? That first, that second one there, Aaron Parecki, he says his RSVP, no. That actually came from here. This is an RSVP posted to Aaron Parecki's own site. So he posted an RSVP to his site. He sent a web mention back to the event, which he's referring to here. And you can see all his presentation details that he decided to implement. And then it showed up as, a, as an RSVP. Now, Aaron, Ben Wordmuller decided to only show the status of the RSVP. He RSVP'd no. He decided to not show the comment. That's fine. When you own your own site, you can decide what to show. That's part of the beauty of it. So this brings us to 2014. You know, do we have a chance? It's like, it's us, it's a few of us that have gotten a few things working that look nice versus the mega silos. How can you compete with that? Well, 
there are signs that silos are actually running out of steam. How many of you have noticed the new Twitter layout? Some of you. If you, look, if you look at your Twitter profile, if you adopt their new profile, try it out, add an image, you might notice that it looks almost identical to Facebook. On the left is Facebook. On the right is Twitter. Right? The silos are running out of ideas. If, if this isn't an obvious uh, piece of evidence that the silos are essentially racing to this sort of lowest common denominator of, of user experience, they're, they're converging on a dead end of user experience. Like, they can't come up with anything new. They're stuck. So we can, we, this gives us a chance to out-innovate them. One of the things we decided with the IndieWeb efforts is that, yes, we focused it on creators first, on developers, core developers, core designers, to actually get things working, to get work done, instead of, being, uh, instead of all discussions being lost in the noise. But we realized we needed to grow this beyond just the core group of developers, beyond just doing it for ourselves. And that was an area where uh, Amber Case, anthropologist by training, really helped us understand what's going on, what we needed to do. And we identified four different indie web generations that made sense to, to, to work on and help adapt where we realize each generation is really going to only be able to explain the problem and teach the next generation. So right now, there's a lot of us in generation one, development leaders that have gotten this working. And we're working on talking to journalists and bloggers, people that are like, hey, I had a blog. How can I update it to do all that cool indie web stuff that you guys are doing? So we've gotten a little bit of success with that. This article was published just last week. Any of you see this by Dan Gilmore on Slate? Welcome to the indie web movement. The amazing things about th this article is not that he published it, is not that he's a journalist that he's writing about the indie web. I mean, that's great, right? It's always good to get press. But press is just talk. We don't think that amounts to much. Anything can be hyped. The amazing thing about this is this little bit right here at the bottom. He says, in fact, it's what I'm doing right now with this post, at least with the version that's also appearing on my personal blog. Dan posted this first on his original on his own website. So he's practicing what he's preaching. Dan is a journalist. Dan is posting to his indie website and syndicating to Slate. He's syndicating a copy out. We call this technique posse. Publish on your own site and syndicate elsewhere. It's an extremely powerful technique because you can own your content and still get distribution. Now, we're not done here. The other thing Dan got working is integration with a bunch of different comment systems across the web. And when I say comment systems, I really mean silos. So if you look down here, it says 92 comments. Those comments didn't all come from people going to dangilmore.com, logging in and typing in a comment. I'll show you where they came from. They were distributed. So here, the first one, Robin Taylor liked this article on twitter.com. What does that mean? Anyone? I don't have a guess what that means. It means Dan cross-posted, he posted from his own website to Twitter. And that copy on Twitter, someone favored it. Someone hit the little star button and lit it up. And because Dan has, has hooked in with this service called Bridgie to gather all those interactions on his copies back to his own website, it showed up as an interaction here that someone liked that article on Twitter.com. The next comment here is Brian Hendrickson mentioned this article on BrianHendrickson.com. So this, this is purely distributed, site to site, indie website to indie website interaction. The next comment, Mark Paul Rubin says a comment, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, via plus.google.com. So Dan copied his article, not just to the Slate, but to Google Plus, and also a summary of it to Twitter. And by doing that, he provided a place for all of his friends to see his content and interact with it, and then he's pulling all that back into the original. So now his site, his original, is a superset of what any one of those silos can provide. He's providing a better experience, a more complete experience on his own site than what any silo could do, than what any silo has an incentive to do, right? This is the kind of power that we're talking about, and this is what's happening now. This brings me to my conclusion here. The indie web wants you. We want you to own your data. We want you to own your permalinks. We want you to own your identity online, and we think you have the ability to do this now. If Dan, who's a journalist, can do this, and that was a WordPress blog, by the way, with a, with a bunch of plugins that were set up. If he can do this, then all of you who are coders, who are creators, who are designers, who work on the web day in and day out, you breathe markup, you, be, you breathe style, you breathe script, right? You can do this as well. 
So I can only show you the door. Here are the resources. We've got the Indie Web Camp channel on Freenode on IRC. There's a web interface as well if you don't have an IRC client. We have, a, we have an amazing wiki resource that basically tells you how to get started no matter where you are, whether you need to start by a domain name or whether you need to start setting up a solution. And we encourage you to edit it as well. Start by building indie web features into your site, even if it's just small things. One of the first things I did was build the ability to post notes on my own site. Why? Because I was frustrated with Twitter. I was frustrated with the fail whale. I was frustrated with there is no way to navigate among my tweets on Twitter. There's no next tweet, previous tweet. Why is that? It only took me a handful of JavaScript to make it work. Why doesn't Twitter do that? I don't know. I wanted that experience. If you want to have control of your experience, you have to own it. Yes, despite the fact that this is the indie web, we also have a Twitter account as well. So people read there, made sense to be there. And lastly, perhaps most importantly, if you can get to an indie web camp in person, attend one because you'll find that the community is extremely helpful and wants to help you own your data and take control of your site, of your identity, of your permalinks. Thank you.